I welcome you uh, for coming to our own panel on uh, digital humanities education in Korea. We are a collaborative research team, it's called uh, Developing a Network uh, Digital Humanities Education Model. And then this is our first time visit to uh, uh, ADHO, so I'm pretty much exci excited. So let me start by introducing our panelists first. My name is Jaeyoung Lee, and then I'm uh, teaching Korean literature and um, uh, uh, digital humanities at Ulsan National Institute of Science and Technology. And the UNIST is one of the five institutes that researches uh, cutting edge science and technology in Korea. Um, my, my colleague uh, uh, here, Hyunghun Kim, and then uh, he is an assistant professor at the Graduate School of AI, and he does research on uh, AI uh, multimodal learning. And then he and I are uh, developing a uh, undergraduate course uh, for uh, DH areas, and then we're going to teach together. And then Dr. Yongsu Kim uh, is professor of English at Hallim uh, University, where he created and expanded. Uh, digital Humanities and Arts program, which is a huge success uh, these days. And then Dr. Yu uh, is an assistant professor in German linguistics, and then she teaches computer-assisted language courses uh, to undergraduate at Gachan University. And then finally, Dr. Uh, Suhyun Moon uh, is a uh, professor of German history at Hanyang University, and then there she develops a course uh, in digital uh, history. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she is joining us online today. Uh, so you will be wondering why and how we came together as a panel with uh, such a diverse uh, academic and pedagogical backgrounds. So our goal is to develop uh, DH courses across the uh, boundaries of individual universities and then make them accessible to participating institutions. So this is a three-year uh, project funded by the National Research Foundation of Korea. So the first year is focused on the course preparation, and the second year we are, will be teaching the course within our own schools, and then final year will be dedicated to making the course accessible, available for credit exchange with the four participating in, uh, universities. So this year is our second year, but Yongsu has already taught his course uh, English course uh, in the previous semester, and then he is very faster than us. <laughs> so, therefore, uh, we uh, today uh, would like to present how we uh, have prepared and offered a uh, course in each institute. And we have implemented a comprehensive approach that incorporates various tools uh, such as a multimodal training, network analysis, corpus analysis and geographic information systems. So we would like to focus on how these tools challenge, enrich, and deepen the various interpretive traditions of the humanities in uh, respective courses. So through our courses, uh, we hope that we provide students with a uh, multi-dimensional learning experience and combines the technology, critical thinking, and interdisciplinary approaches. To ensure uh, effectiveness of our research approaches, we will look for advice from the experts in digital humanities and research and education over the world. So your insights and expertise would be a valuable asset for us to further developing courses, uh, contents, uh, and forms uh, both ways. So today, uh, we will be uh, presenting in the following order. So me and hyung -hun is going to talk about the multimodal learning uh, with a visual, uh, visual and a textual data, helping the, uh, how we can help the engineering students experience automatic writing and raise questions about these writing outputs. And then next, yong -su is going to deal with the social network analysis, how, can, how we can be applicable to uh, an English literature class to enrich the uh, interpretation of works. And then Surin will uh, explain how to collect and process the German language data uh, and then link it to corpus analysis and then machine learning. And then finally, Suhyun will explore how the uh, GIS can be uh, utilized to track the actions and the events of uh, historical figures and then enable us to ask 
what were uh, uh, the questions that were not previously raised uh, in traditional methods. So each presentation is going to be about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we're going to have a, a Q&A session after all the uh, presentations are, are over. And then uh, this course, uh, Literary Understanding of a Multimodal Generation, uh, is aims to help the engineering students to generate and interpret and uh, short narratives. The narratives will be generated by the extracting some simple text from uh, ca uh, uh, camera images and uh, training them to use uh, literary works. In doing so, we invite the students to think further how to interpret the strange or semantically illegible expressions uh, that are generated by AI. The course is offered in the School of Liberal Arts and are targeted 40 students, uh, including uh, second year to fourth year students. And then those students uh, should have completed an AI programming course. Uh, they are eligible for this course. And then our course preparation was significantly uh, uh, influenced by the on groundbreaking collaboration with, between the Ross Goodwin and the Google team. And then their innovative project is called Riding with a Car. And then in this project, they creatively outfitted a car with a camera, microphone, GPS, uh, and a laptop computer that had been already pre-trained with a collection of books. So starting on a three-day three -day journey from the New York to New Orleans, they leveraged the power of a pre-trained book collection, which consists of uh, travel books and 200 uh, carefully selected, quote unquote, bleak stories by Goodwin himself. As, as a car uh, cruising along roads, the automated writing system seem, seamlessly generated certain narratives, which were then printed through the uh, receipt printer installed uh, with the computer. Uh, right. And the automatic writing system was made through the combination of uh, different uh, language models. Uh, first one is a CNN, RNN, and LSTM later. And then CNN played a role of uh, transporting the visual data captured by the uh, car's camera into the textual interpretations. Then RNN took it over and utilizing the text generated by the CNN and then transcriptions from the car's microphone. And then this model enriches by the pre-trained text extracted from the 12, uh, 200 and more books, uh, which generate a more extensive piece of writing. So in doing so, uh, LSTM retained the crucial uh, contextual information from the preceding text. So capable of uh, LSTM ensure the continuity in the generated narratives by the maintaining the memory of a previous uh, textual input. However, uh, generated sentences provided this design did not constantly show the high quality. I mean, so take a look at the you know uh, strange expressions. That's not really logical. But we could could find some really uh, in inspiring uh, sentences in there. But uh, basically, I mean, it's, uh, the quality is uh, is not. I mean, the level that we expected. Uh, but it, it was uh, groundbreaking in, in the year of 2018 at the time. Um, so our question is, in order to generate a more coherent and intricate narrative from the image data, how can we do that? And then particularly, how we could generate a Korean narrative through this multimodal training? So. Our course is composed of three sections. In the first section, students will delve into the theory and the practical uh, practices, uh, practical aspects of a multimodal training. And then they will have uh, hands-on experience in exploring different kinds of data, including text, image, and video. Then students will have their opportunity to propose and proceed their own projects. And then uh, finally, around the end of the course, uh, students are invited to the crucial uh, uh, critical analysis and interpretation of the works generated by the AI systems. Students will examine the implication of anthropocentric versus anti-anthropocentric perspectives. And then through these thoughtful discussions and analysis, students will gain a deeper understanding of the role of AI in the creative processes.
hello. Uh, my name is Hyungwoon Kim uh, from UNC, uh, UNIST AIGS. So let me begin. So I will cover these three things today. So first I will uh, talk about why multimodal learning is important. And then I will briefly uh, introduce the language model and the image captioning for those who are not familiar with this concept. And then I will uh, presenting some plans and the uh, so course plan so that handle this technique. Okay, let me begin. So first, so why multimodal learning? So as a human, we are not inspired uh, not inspired by only uh, what we read. We also motivated by uh, uh, what we see and. Uh, we also influenced by what we hear, like music or something, and we also uh, feel some emotion, and then uh, create created some articles or writings. So, so we are multimodal. So not only solely uh, the texture uh, creature. So, yeah, multi. multi uh, uh, machine learning field is two. So, so machine learning, the machine can create uh, uh, text from the image and uh, from the emotion and the sounds. And also, uh, machine can imagine or uh, create some images from what they read, what they read and uh, kind the of describe some emotional texture from the text, and then also make a sound from what they read. So, but in this course, we will stick to this, only this part, from image to uh, text. So, yeah, so let me inter briefly introduce what language model is and image captioning. So I asked the chat GPT about what language model is. So the language model is a type of artificial intelligence, blah, blah, blah. But you can just focus on the blue part. The language model is predict the next word or sequence of words in the sentence from the data. So that is, the language model is about creating, uh, writing a sentence with the data. OK, so let's have uh, some examples. So we have uh, three uh, sentences like this, and then with a blank. And we can easily uh, predict the, what words will come next, right? So for the first sentence, uh, um, skiing or fishing, home or something can come. And then for the second uh, sentence, so cat or ball or something possible. Or for the third, and table, chair or something, it's possible. Okay, then how, so yeah, so the blue part of the shade, uh, blue shade part can be seen as a context for the next, creating the next words. And how can we teach a machine to learn these things? So yeah, this is a very simple uh, example of a, a neural network that can learn how to create a write a sentence. So okay, you can see. Oh, this is this is animation, but it it, it is not working yet. But so yeah, so I will go over it one by one. So in this case, the I is an input, and then the model should predict so as output. Then the I so can be input, and the model should generate all. And then this time I so all is input in context, and then model should generate cat, so and so on. So in this way, the model can pr uh, pre predict and train, uh, train the to predict the next word one by one. Okay, so you may know the GPT-3, right? 
So GPT-3 is also one kind of language model, large language model that is trained on the huge, da huge amount of data. So in this case, the context is recite the first law of robotics and then GPT uh, predict the, the a robot may not injured or something, blah, blah, blah. So, and this is a more detailed animation. So yeah, as you can see, model predict the whole sentence one by one. Yeah, this is another one. So as you can see, the context size is 2,085. So if you, uh, if you want to uh, expand the context, then you, you will need uh, more memory and computation power. Okay, so yeah, that is another example, uh, illustration on how GPT-3 is trained. Okay, so yeah, this is called in-context learning. So w we present or show some examples, and for example, in this case, the code generation, we have a question and query and the, the answer code, and the, we have two examples then we finally, we ask the, a real question to the GPT-3. Then GPT-3 uh, can generate the code. So this is also language model. But instead of the text, they, uh, tr they treat the code itself. Uh, yes, yeah, so you also you may heard about the ChatGPT. Yeah, ChatGPT is a kind of advanced version of the GPT. But only difference between the GPT and ChatGPT is this part. So ChatGPT is trained on the human preference uh, on the, the multiple answers, and then model uh, is trained on that preference to generate a better uh, response. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the image captioning. So. Uh, language model again, so, but we can pre prepend some images like this. Then what word would come next? Skiing, right? What about this? In this case, cat. And in this case, coach, right? So now we can, uh, the context includes the uh, image itself. So we can see the uh, context is expanded, then the prediction is more, can be more accurate. Okay, this is one simple but representative uh, model for the image captioning. So at that time, we used the CNN and LSTM for create a, a caption, image caption. Okay, then what to do with this? So in the course, so, so this is concept of our baseline model to provide the students uh, to play with this. So the concept is that students can take a picture, photo or something, and then they feed this photo to the model. Then model pro uh, produce some description. So. That, this is a very, very basic baseline, but uh, uh, students can improve it on their own. And we also tried this prototype for the course. So in this case, we take the cap, uh, image captioning model and then produce the uh, caption itself. And then we put this caption to the GPT model to generate the more detailed uh, description. But as you can see here, uh, the result is not that good yet. So, so now we are trying to improve it before the course. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. So uh, creating a uh, generative model of using the text uh, image data and the text data is um, 
important part of this course, but more important one is how to interpret this. So uh, interpretation of the computer generated text will be really challenging because I mean human evaluation in engineering fields require the human uh, centered attitude to generate the uh, expressions that approximate the human writings. However, in order to consider expressions, they do not make sense uh, as a due object of reading. We need first to acknowledge the um, non-human beings as a social and literary agent. So this conflict between the anthropocentric and an anti-anthropocentric per perspectives raise a question of what interpretive uh, viewpoint should we develop uh, when reading the works of produced by an AI writers. So one way uh, to understand that the work of AI, I guess it, it can be through the ben Benjamins, uh, Benjamins, the concept of a planner, uh, applying the both their concept of a dilettant stroller to the cultural analysis. Uh, Benjamin uh, described a figure who is detached from the urbanizing and modernizing society to read the underpinnings of capitalism sustained by the commodification of labor. AI strollers seems like the uh, similar, so being detached from the human society, which operates on the uh, emotions triggered by capital and material. I mean, it shows to us how human affection and cognition interact and operate. So I guess this, this could be some sort of a, a third way or one of the uh, uh, ways in which we, we can uh, use the cultural studies context into the reading of uh, AI generated text. Okay. Thank you so much for your, uh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, my name is Yong Soo Kim. Um, nice to meet you. Uh, I have uh, just 15 minutes uh, to present, uh, to do my presentation, so I have to be very brief. Okay, so I guess I'm the only one uh, who didn't prepare a uh, presentation slide <laughs> in this entire conference. <laughs> so instead, uh, I used uh, a Notion page. So this is uh, what it looks like. So my, uh, my presentation title is uh, English Literature and Network Analysis. It's uh, my course title, too. Uh, I actually uh, taught this course uh, this previous semester uh, in my university, Harlem University. So as Jayan explained very well, uh, this is kind of part of the uh, bigger project, uh, developing uh, networked DH education in South Korea. So my, uh, my course, of course, is part of the project. And I have uh, mainly two goals. Uh, one, I, want, I, want to, uh, I wanted to introduce my students uh, this typical uh, Korean uh, humanities students to this emerging field of uh, digital humanities and its uh, theory and uh, uh, practice. But, and the second goal uh, is to open this class to the students of four different universities in South Korea. So the second goal, I think, is, is very important uh, in, uh, in the context of the uh, current uh, situation in, in Korea because I don't know about other countries, but in, right now in South Korea, there's a huge demand uh, for DH education. But the problem is 
uh, uh, not, there is not enough uh, adequate uh, teachers who can uh, cover uh, this, uh, who can meet these needs. So it's kind of a vicious circle. Uh, not many teachers, uh, not many, uh, not much education of DHC. So it, uh, so and out of this education program, we do not have enough. Uh, we, we we do not uh, developing. We do not develop the next generation DHC scholars and teachers. So that's the problem. So I think this network, uh, networked education model uh, can be uh, one possible solution uh, to this problem. That's why we are focusing on this networked education. So as I said before, I uh, taught this course in this semester, uh, last semester. So one thing you have to remember is that uh, my students had no uh, prior knowledge or experience of digital humanities at all. And uh, as a typical humanities student in South Korea, they have no, they are not skilled uh, in digital technology. So there's a huge daunting task uh, for me. So I have to teach them uh, what digital humanities is and what is the, uh, and uh, I have to teach them network analysis uh, theory and uh, methodology and its application to uh, the interpretation of literary uh, works. And finally, at the end of the semester, they have to perform a uh, digital humanity pr uh, project. So it's a, a, lot, a lot of things to cover uh, in this one semester uh, DH introduction course. Okay, let's get into the process. Uh, I'm uh, giving you the result of the last semester's uh, exper uh, experience and experiment. So before we got, I got into the real uh, implementation of the course, uh, I prepared uh, a few things for my students. First of all, for networked education system uh, model, uh, I experiment, experimented with this uh, metaverse platform, which is called uh, Naver Zap. Uh, I, I'm not sure you are familiar with uh, Naver, but it's very similar to uh, Gather Town. Uh, it's a 2D, uh, 2D metaverse. Uh, uh, platform. So I created, uh, it looks like this, uh, it looks like this. Uh, so why I chose uh, Zap uh, over uh, Zoom, you know, you, so in the COVID-19 period, uh, a lot of people used uh, Zoom, uh, online uh, conferencing uh, application, but uh, it has a lot of limitations. But in, uh, on the other hand, uh, this Metaverse platform has a lot of advantages over uh, uh, Zoom-like uh, online conferencing application. Uh, it has all the functionalities of, of the Zoom, but at the same time, it has additional features. So it, if you look at this, there are different spaces for different purposes. There's a lecture room, we have a project uh, group, group activity room, uh, it has even have a cafe, <laughs> all this, and personal conference room, okay? So we, have, we can uh, allocate these different spaces for different purposes. And uh, students, and, and including myself, can move around, around very easily. So that's why I chose uh, uh, Metaverse uh, platform. And it looks like this. Uh, so students are having uh, group activities at the same time. And they can move around uh, uh, finding uh, uh, peer students in one space. And second of all, uh, I said students have no uh, knowledge of digital humanities at all. So for, for them, I made uh, about 28 uh, tutorial videos, and I, uh, I put them on the YouTube channel, and it looks like this. So it covers uh, digital humanities and network analysis theory and concepts, and uh, at the same time, uh, it, it covers the actual uh, how-to uh, methods uh, of uh, uh, visualization tool, uh, Gephi. Okay. Uh, I, in addition to this uh, network analysis uh, tutorial videos, I, uh, I added uh, some GIS, uh, you know, uh, GIS tools, uh, easy, easy tools to use. Uh, I, think, I, I think all of you may be familiar with these tools. And also, I created digital textbooks. So I used the uh, form slit. But I want to go, I want to visit this uh, website, but I don't have enough time, so I can uh, uh, go ahead with, with this uh, screenshot. So it looks like this. Uh, there's a video. You can play with the vid or tutorial video. At the same time, on the right side, uh, you have a text and screenshot. And I also used the Notion uh, page. 
So we have a kind of database uh, for my uh, tutorial videos and uh, textbooks. Uh, it also looks like this. Okay, let's get into the next part. So what happened uh, in uh, real classes uh, in spring 2023? So it was a kind of a, a hybrid class. It's the first stage of, of, of the development. So I used 50% uh, 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 offline classroom uh, and 50% online metaverse uh, space. So it was, it was a good combination because uh, offline classes have uh, its own advantages over online uh, class. So. But the, the challenge is that in the third year of this project, I have to uh, use 100% online uh, platform. So that's a kind of challenge. So I divided my work, and I, in, especially in online classes, I mainly focused on software tu tutorial and practices, personal conference, and group activities. And I chose Oscar Wilde Salome as a main text, main literary text. Uh, first of all, it's very, very short. It's, it's an uh, exciting uh, play. And play is, 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 to, is easy to, uh, to, to do a network analysis, especially character uh, network analysis, because it had the, the play text itself has the uh, character's names and it's the dialogues. So it's very easy to extract uh, only character names and, and the dialogue. Uh, so you can uh, proceed with uh, character analysis and dialogue analysis too. So this is a, the, uh, one of the examples uh, done by the students. Uh, it, of course, this is the first just uh, try. But uh, it has, uh, immediately you can see uh, we have a Harold and Salome are the main characters. We have two, two universes uh, colliding with each other. Uh, and the, this uh, 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 the node color uh, signifies the gender uh, differences. So you can see uh, this play is, is predominated by uh, male characters, but at the same time, uh, just, just, just a small number of female characters uh, is strong enough to confront uh, this uh, male uh, universe. Okay, so this kind of uh, students uh, uh, learned how to uh, uh, visualize this net network. And second of all, I prepared a data set, oh, not me, but, oh, okay, so, sorry. I prepared this Salome uh, audiences list uh, data and uh, and I provide this data uh, for, for my students. And I, I, I happen to find this great uh, corpus uh, done by uh, Adam, Professor Adam Hammond in, in the University of Toronto. Uh, I'm uh, very glad to find this uh, uh, data set on GitHub. So I, I suggest to you, oh, this is a great uh, resources. Uh, I want to cover, I want to show you uh, this uh, GitHub uh, place and you can see uh, Project uh, Diaries of Novel Corpus. Uh, and uh, I don't have much time, but it has this, uh, it, uh, what, what is so valuable of this, this uh, data set is that uh, it has uh, novel text. It's very difficult uh, for, uh, if you are familiar with uh, network analysis, it's very difficult to have the correct names because novel is, is all about narrative. So he or she, or all the different references to characters. So manually, they worked on this, uh, all these novels and they created this data set. Especially, even though this, this data set is not designed for network analysis, uh, it provides uh, us with a very valuable uh, information, that is like speaker and addressee. So this is perfect for network analysis. So, oh, sorry. So we, uh, uh, I recommended this uh, data set to my students. And uh, uh, we created a, a Based on this novel text, we created adjacency matrix files. It's very difficult to make this file. Uh, we, uh, in one sentence, all these uh, words are connected to, to each other. Uh, we need a very uh, complex code. As I said before, uh, my students are not familiar with coding at all. They, they actually hate uh, coding. So uh, what a great relief uh, this year, uh, ChatGPT suddenly appeared, <laughs> and uh, we used uh, ChatGPT, and uh, students, uh, 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 not easily, but they managed to create uh, the code they needed uh, to, to make this uh, adjacency matrix files. So I, I also, uh, for the next uh, year, I, I uh, uh, put all those uh, data sets and uh, uh, Python calls, calls uh, on this Notion page. Uh, it's all collected in my uh, class Notion page. I will show you later. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, oh. 
It looks like this, okay? But anyway, uh, this is a, I also made a video uh, to how to use uh, ChatGPT to make uh, a code. So th this is the result of, of the class, uh, stu students' uh, DH projects. So I cannot get into de in detail, but uh, anyway, we conducted these projects uh, uh, in the second half of the semester. Uh, they did the two presentations, and it's evaluated by the students, not me. And I also uh, applied uh, peer evaluation to prevent uh, 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 free riding, so, and it worked. So, and all those completed projects are, uh, are archived and exhibited uh, on the project web page. Uh, it looks like this. Also, Notion page. Uh, I just showed you uh, before. And uh, so this is a project uh, page. It looks like this. Oh, this is a, my uh, course page. Uh, all, I collected all this uh, information together. But this is, this is the result of a student project. We had a six uh, student projects in 2023. Let me just, uh, I, how much time do I have? Two minutes. Two minutes? Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, I thought I, I went very fast. Uh, okay, let me just show you. Uh, this is done by a student uh, on The Great Gatsby. So let me briefly just show you. Uh, uh, so he did, she did a K-turn network analysis, and uh, you can see uh, Nick is the main, uh, I mean, the center of this, all, all these character relationships, and obvious is he, Nick is the narrator. Uh, oh, I cannot explain everything uh, because I don't have much time, but... Uh, this is the adjacency matrix uh, visualization, uh, only with, uh, composed with nouns. And he, she, she found this very interesting uh, uh, feature. Uh, we have Daisy, uh, Tom, that's, that's obvious. But we have these time-related words, uh, a lot of time-related words. So I cannot get into that. But uh, so, he, so, she, so she went deeper uh, into this network analysis. So she only collected, uh, gets, uh, uh, what is this? Oh, time-related words, okay? Only uh, time-related sentences, and then visualized it again. Then he, she found uh, at the center of this time-related words network, we have Gatsby, okay? So she made, uh, she, she had this question, why time? So. Uh, she proceed, proceeded on uh, to, uh, to went on to the character analysis uh, because we don't, I don't have much time. I only uh, focus on Gatsby. So she, this time she collected only Gatsby speeches and then analyzed again. So she found very interesting uh, feature. Uh, Gatsby is uh, very uh, obsessed with the word thing, and all this thing is related to, related to this so extravagant words like. Uh, luxury items, showing his wealth and richness, money, okay? So, so that's one thing she found. Uh, let's move on to, so it has a very different feature from Tom, uh, even though it is related to thing. Okay, this, let's move on, uh, skip, uh, Daisy and Jordan. So she, 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 she went on to only Nick's uh, uh, narration, excluding all the dialogues. Uh, then she found uh, these uh, time-related words uh, found. So we can see the difference between Nick and Gatsby. In Gatsby's speeches, there's not much time-related time, time -related words, but in Nick's narration. So uh, we can see the, the gap between the, the actual character and the narrator. Okay, so I can, I think, uh, even though this is a, her first uh, experience with network analysis, we can develop this into a kind of a character, a character theory. Uh, okay, so I, because I don't have much time, uh, I, I'll skip all these things. Uh, so let's uh, go to the concluding uh, part. So what's my plan for the 2025 class? So I have to make uh, more tutorial videos and textbooks. And I have to open uh, this, this course to the students of the four different universities. And because we, have, we, have, we are going to have a student projects, the, the things I showed just, just now, so we are going to have a, a mixed group of, with students from different universities. Uh, and I'm, I think we can have an online conference uh, 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 developing their uh, project presentation into an online conference. And finally, we are going to have a, 
uh, joint online project exhibition, and all these projects will be uh, archived and exhibited on online uh, Notion page, and it will be open to the public, uh, to all of you, okay? Uh, that's it uh, uh, for my presentation. Thank you very much. everyone. Thank you for coming to our panel presentation. The title of my presentation uh, is Applying German Corpus-Based Dialogue Analysis to Machine Learning, but the contents will focus on introducing a digital humanities teaching model for undergraduate students uh, majoring in German language and literature. I'd like to start by giving uh, 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 giving you an overview of Gachan University and um, Humanities uh, Liberal Arts College where I work and courses of Humanities and its students. Then uh, I will share the syllabus of a co um, course I've been teaching since 2019, uh, explaining the goals and contents of the course and the outcomes uh, of students. Next, I will introduce an advanced course on applying German corpus, uh, corpora to machine learning that I'm currently developing in uh, this framework of cross-university collaboration. Finally, I'd like to share with you my thoughts on the challenges and prospect of developing and delivering these courses. Gachan University is a comprehensive university in Gyeonggi province, a suburb of Seoul, divided into two campuses, uh, the global campus, uh, where houses the College of Humanities, Social Sciences, or, and so on. Uh, and uh, the other campus uh, houses the College of Medicine, Nursing, Pharmacy, and he uh, of he uh, the College of Health Science. As of the 2021 uh, academic year, there are 14 colleges and 46 majors. It is a large university with approximately 22,000 students. Gachan University is a so-called mid-tier university that aims to break into the two, uh, top 20 private universities in South Korea, although the grades uh, and learning ability of freshmen are actually increasing every year. Students in the humanities are often reluctant to learn quantitative methodologies and computer-based analysis tools. Even at my university, Learning um, Python is required in liberal arts seminars, but the humanity students I've, I've met have little understanding of the programming language and little idea of how to use it in their majors. I think the reason for this lies in curriculum of the humanities. Uh, the College of Humanities has uh, mm, uh, 1,800 students enrolled in four departments, uh, uh, so-called uh, Department of Korean Language and Literature, English Language and Literature, <coughs> sorry, uh, Oriental, Oriental and European Language and Literature. This, despite the names Oriental and European, they only teach Japanese, Chinese, German, and French. Um, notably, as the uh, department name suggests, all language majors focus on language learning and uh, understanding of literature. The figure um, one, oh, oh, sorry, this, right, <coughs> side, 
Um, okay, where is that? Um, shows the proportion of language and literature courses in the total 179 courses offered by the four departments in two semesters this year. Literature is um, 39% um, and uh, language is 40, uh, 30, um, 34%. With two disciplines combined are counting for 75 uh, of all courses. If we include cultural contents and regional studies courses, the total reaches 85%. Linguistics courses make up 9%. Of all humanities courses, as shown in the figure one, with 14 courses being offered in 20. Uh, 2023. Linguistic, linguistics have been perceived as marginal in most Korean humanities departments and have been offered in very small numbers. Until two years ago, introduction to linguistics, for example, was offered as a required course providing an overview of language change, lexical and grammatical characteristics, or uh, pract uh, practa practicing uh, key concepts of the traditional subfield of phonology, morphology, syntax, and semantics. Since 20, 2021, uh, inter entrepreneurship uh, education courses, which have been in the spotlight in society, have been introduced into the curriculum as mandatory courses, making linguistics an optional subject, uh, further rele uh, relegating it to the periphery of students' interest. It's not just about a matter of quantity, but also about contents. What kind of specific topics and methodology are covered in linguistics courses will naturally depend on the specialization of the faculty members in each department. But according to the current faculty of humanities at Gachon University, linguistics courses currently focus on normative grammar and foreign language pedagogy. I believe that a deep understanding of language as an information resource, resource and its utilization is core knowledge in the modern data-driven information technology society. But unfortunately, there is a lack of uh, courses in the humanities at Gatchen University that take a data science approach to language. Um, Namely, uh, namely digital humanities. As far as I know, there are no courses in the field of literature and cultural content that cover the application of data science methods to digital resources. In linguistics, corpus linguistic here, um, corpus analysis is covered in the computer assisted, assisted language analysis course in the Department of Korean Language and Literature and text mining with R uh, in, the, in my course, Language Theory and Information Technology Society. Here, these two one. The name of my course is kind of funny, but I didn't make it up. So let's just call it language information for short. Let's take a look at the syllabus for, uh, for the course, language information. In this course, I'm emphasized to students that all knowledge and stories in the world are expressed, documented, shared, and stored in language, and that the information technologies around us, such as information search engine, artificial intelligence speaker, and machine translator, and so on, are based on the computational analysis of human language. 
In this course, it will be shown how these natural language processing techniques are closely related to an analytic approach to language use and understanding of its communicative function. The goal of this course is to help students understand um, the segmental and hierarchical nature of language and to learn how to analyze linguistic data so that they will be able to analyze and exploit a wide variety of unstructured linguistic resources, uh, majoring in uh, liter literature or history. To this end, the course is organized into a theoretical first half, uh, analysis drill, and the second half uh, for uh, applying uh, applied analysis uh, of real uh, text files. Uh, special, uh, specifically, it integrates linguistic knowledge and computational data processing into text mining with R. Students We'll begin practicing analyzing textual data after a basic introduction to understanding data frames and analytical functions in R. They will learn through the steps of cleaning unstructured data, taking language part of speech information in text, looking at frequency information, and uh, creating word cloud. Mm -hmm. okay. Students, this one, then students used uh, movie review data to pre uh, practice uh, sentimental analysis in all and expand their list of positive words and negative words um, uh, as, as uh, as they get uh, the data. Uh, here you can see a case of uh, a, an example of outcomes of a student's pro project. The students built a data set of research paper abstracts on stress by profession. As shown in figure four, they extracted and compared keywords related to stressor from 824 in the teacher field, 641 abstract in the police field, uh, 25 in the arts and performer, and 114 in the medical um, occupations. Uh, and used sentiment analysis to identify differences in the ratio of uh, negative positive words. Then, now I would like to introduce a project-based learning course that I'm developing as an advanced co course. In this course, I want students to understand that human language is represented in vector form, which allows us to quantitatively reproduce information about the semantic relationships of words, their syntactic uses, etc. Et we will use techniques such as word embedding in Python, and most importantly, experiments with machine learning, conversation, prediction, by building an authentic conversation data, data set and annotating compu, uh, communicative functional features for speech act of utterances. Mm, here, the German corpus and their URL are represented. Mm. For example, Leipzig Corpora Collection, German spoken language data of German Institute. This uh, the German get, uh, spoken uh, data of German Language Institute. Uh, 
uh, we downloaded uh, some um, data, uh, spoken language data or uh, conversational data uh, by um, situation, uh, by the cri uh, criterion of uh, particular situation. Uh, for example, uh, telephone uh, conversation or uh, uh, shopping uh, conversation. Um, here you can see the another corpus. Oh, oh, sorry, it's shown already over. Mm. Here you can see the another corpus where we get some mobile con uh, conversation. Oops. Data from uh, 954 uh, chats. Here you can see the data, data set from uh, this Mukoda to uh, web pages. Um, I'm sorry. The steps of works in, the, in this course are the same. But I try to deliver students, mm, uh, mm, mm, provide uh, students a new platform, Python. Uh, importing a data set, importing the data set in Python and uh, pre-processing uh, the uh, text data uh, and then segmentation and uh, tagging of speech of um, part of speeches and tokenization and extraction um, of nouns and so on. Okay, uh, let, me mm, let me come to conclusion or discussion. Uh, today, we, mm, I do not get into the details of word embedding or building training data sets for machine learning with deep level conversational annotations. In particular, conversational annotation is a very challenging task, uh, especially for foreign language learners. So we are working hard to build specific hands-on materials. Meaningful and accurate annotation of speaker intent in terms of speech acts requires a deep understanding of the pragmatic, functional, and cultural aspect of a human conversation. In this context, we need a structured education model that works with literature and culture uh, expertise, expertises to give the undergraduate students hands-on analytical practice with a variety of authentic text resources. This is a tangible outcome that a university like Gachon University, which has a shortage of digital humanities researchers, can achieve by participating in this collaborative project. To my final issue, I'm wondering if I should teach a so-called no-code software solution, like here, uh, Voyant Tools, Veka, and Orange, and so on. As you can see in figure eight, sorry, here, <laughs> uh, no figure number, uh, they typically use drag and drop functionality and visual workflow. I see the uh, potential for this kind of program that allows students to focus on the creative contents of digital analysis while experience a variety of uh, data science analytic without the fear of coding. My students will be happy and I will be even happier that I'm not forcing them to code. However, I think it's still valid to keep teaching basic coding-based data analysis not engineering specific coding. I mean, I believe that an analytic understanding of language resources is fundamental to the analytic understanding, uh, oh, sorry, it's, 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 it's double uh, reading. Fundamental to the successful analysis of textual uh, resources 
across all digital humanities topics and disciplines. This means that even if ChatGPT complements our knowledge more and more plausibly, and it cannot replace using language to express, share, and interact with change. So we must continue to teach these analytic properties, hierarchies, and communicative functions of a human language. That's all. And I look forward to getting your opinion or comments. Thank you. Both presentations will be online, and I uh, wonder if you can start the uh, video. Hanyang University, Korea. I am an analog historian who was trained in the German social history and continued to do research in this field. So unlike many of you here, I don't have uh, a strong interest in doing digital humanities research on the one hand. But on the other hand, I do feel a strong sense of obligation to give my students the opportunity to think about digital history methods. Today, I just want to share with you my thoughts on how to integrate the digital humanities method into Western history course, although I don't have any sophisticated uh, knowledge of digital humanities method. I must say that I received help from two of my undergraduate students, Han Gyal Kim and Bom Young An. First of all, I want to explain where I started. In the history department of Hanyang University, where I work, there is no separate digital history course. And I can only teach digital history by incorporating some digital history methods into the existing courses that I already teach. It. Thereby, one good thing is that students are familiar with Python, at least. All freshmen in the College of Humanities at Hanyang University, they are required to take three courses on digital methods. The title is like this, Creative Computing, Creative Programming, and AI and Machine Learning. Therefore, I can relatively easily add some digital history elements to my already developed courses, like modern Western history. I am looking forward to incorporating digital history methods into my course titled Special Topics in Modern Western History I, that I will teach in this uh, fall semester. In this, Western, in this modern Western history course, I usually cover four main topics and I am thinking of using digital history methods in the second and third of these topics. The biggest challenge in preparing for this lecture is creating a data set. After much thought, I realized that the most realistic and feasible way to do this was to use data that had already been created and was available online. As a result, I was able to find three sets of data and build my presentation around them. Firstly, I came across a series of books titled International Historical Statistics. This three-volume series covers statistics in Europe between 1750 and 2005. 
it has been widely accepted that the Industrial Revolution first occurred in England and then spread to all the European countries and finally to the rest of the world through the colonization. But in recent years, uh, there has been an increasing emphasis on the uniqueness of each country's industrialization. By selecting and examining various uh, statistical data from this book, students, uh, I expect that students can discover the uniqueness of many industrialized uh, societies. So this graph came from this book, International Historical uh, Statistics. The this slide is a graph based on immigration and emigration statistics for Germany and the United Kingdom. As you see, it is quite clear that Germany had an overwhelming outflow of people's emigration until the end of the First World War. And it was only during the Weimar period that an influx of the people started. For the case of British Empire, it is also clear that there was by far more outflow than inflow. And in explaining the difference between these two countries, students are likely to think of a number of reasons for this, change, this difference, including a very restrictive British citizenship policies, for instance. The next slide is a graph showing the evolution of the taxation system. The graph in blue is the total amount of the taxes. You can see that the after establishment of the French Revolution, uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> after the establishment of the French Third Republic, the taxation increased uh, dramatically. On the other hand, in the United Kingdom, where there was no such a political drama like in France, there seems to have been a relatively gradual change in taxation, although there were some outliers. In this way, the students can experiment with different visualizations based on statistical data and think about the historical causality. It can be a good heuristic learning experience for students. When I asked student one to create interesting questions and to create visualization based on the statistical data, he came up with two questions. The first question is whether there was a correlation between the economic conditions and marriage and birth rate. And the second question, was whether there was a correlation between the number of uh, industrial disputes and the beer production. The first question is a very common demographic question, and the answer to this piece in well with the democratic and the sociological studies. As, as you see, the GDP and marriage are negatively correlated. That means the marriage decreases as GDP increases. In, in this way, the first question is a historically relevant and historically meaningful question. But the second question, the second question, it, as for the, the second question, it is hard to get a meaningful answer by directly relating the number of industrial disputes to the production of beer. Of course, because uh, people <coughs> drink beer for a variety of reasons. In this way, students uh, can have the opportunity to think for themselves about which of their questions are historically significant or historically irre irrelevant. The second data set that I found came from the British Newspaper Archiving Project. And I'm very grateful to the team at the University of Bristol for making this uh, freely available. Now today, for today's talk, I downloaded this entity's da data. From there, I, I, I downloaded and utilized this material, and this entity data is divided into three categories, uh, location, association, and person. 
And this entity data shows the word frequency in UK newspaper archives between 1800 and 1950. If we just sort this Excel data by word frequency, the result is like this. The Excel data itself raises a number of interesting historical questions. For instance, the fact that the most frequently mentioned place name in the British press over the last 150 years is, as you see, Russia. That fact itself is very, very interesting. And the next fact that the three most, three most frequently mentioned figures in the UK media coverage are all US presidents. This is also very impressive and shows the close relationship, extraordinarily close relationship between UK and United States. And students might also reflect, I mean, this data set raises very interesting, a number of interesting questions. For instance, students might also reflect on the incompleteness of this data set as Abraham Lincoln case clearly shows. Abraham Lincoln was born in 1809, but he is mentioned to a significant degree as early as 1800. That puzzling aspect was discovered by my student, uh, stu the second student, and thereby we came to the conclusion that we have to bear in mind that for every person mentioned in the data set, there could be several people with the same name. And the next point, the next interesting point is the difference in the reference frequency between newspaper and the engram data. Example, British Liberal Party. The grape colors uh, are mixed, uh, but in these two graphs, the blue color represents uh, the word frequency of British Liberal Party. The blue graph represents the British Liberal Party. It is generally accepted uh, that the British Liberal Party gave way to the British Labour Party from 1920 onwards. However, if we look at the data on the newspaper coverage, we can see that the mentions of the British Liberal Party are highly volatile. It did not disappear completely at, since the year of 1920. But the engram graph, which shows the word frequency of the British Labour Party, seems to be different. And I guess the reason of this difference is because the United Kingdom has a first past the first voting system, which significantly reduces the number of seats that the British Liberal Party could have in the Congress. But it also shows that a party's influence is not proportional to its number of seats in the case of daily uh, politics. To give students access to geographical information, I am going to use data sets from Katarina Novikas' History of Public Space, which provides Excel data on political activity in the United Kingdom from her website. Her data is divided into two parts, pre-1848 political activity data and the new data set which covers the second half of the 19th century and uh, the first half of the 20th century. By making comparison between this old data set and the new political meeting data set, again, we can find very easily, very interesting historical narratives. First, uh, we can see that uh, the conservative political activities uh, became rare in the new political in the new da data set. Or, according to the new data set, political activities 
were concentrated on two to three main cities like Manchester, London, or Sheffield. But according to the old data set, political activities were widely sca scattered. Or I tried to put this Excel data uh, on, on the map, and I, thereby I selected uh, three uh, political uh, groups, uh, anarchist and the communist group and the feminist group. And their political activities uh, were not overwrapped in these cities, in both cities like Manchester or London. And that clearly shows that these uh, three political factions were geographically segregated. Okay, finally, I want to share my ideas uh, about digital uh, humanities ed education with you. As far as I know, the key benefit of digital history education is uh, to very easily facilitate access to historical substance. I think that uh, through these digital history methods, I can very easily bring my students to a very concrete uh, historical time and place and there, in this concrete uh, historical time and place, the students can formulate their own historical questions very easily, and thereby they would be trained to discern between the historically meaningful and meaningless questions. In this way, the students can experience uh, heuristic learning uh, process. Two main difficulties in dealing with, uh, in teaching digital history methods are the time trade-offs between digital and analog historical methods, first of all, and second obstacle might be how to collect the pre-processed data set uh, for the undergraduate uh, education. Thereby, the problem is not just the digital, but also language problem. I, my specialty is German history, but I had to collect the data sets from the British or English web websites. If I would use German uh, digital data sets, then my students would be doubly estranged. So I, I had to avoid German language data set and had to try to find out the English language data sets. And in this way, the digital uh, hu history education can strengthen the English centeredness. In that sense, I'm deeply concerned. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you very much. And uh, we started uh, about uh, 10 minutes late, and so we still have uh, 15 minutes for discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, pl please let me know. And oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to hear that the field of DH is developing in Korea. Um, I, I worked at Sogang University for a couple of years, and there was not much when, when I was there. But now it, I'm, I'm really happy to see that many universities you are trying to collaborate and develop this uh, project further. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say that I'm, uh, well, I'm Federico Pianzola, and I come from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And I'm coordinating a master in digital humanities, uh, mm -hmm. where we have students coming from different humanities background with mm. no prior experience of coding or digital methods. Mm -hmm. So we are in a similar situation, like having humanities students that right. have no prior experience with, uh, with digital methods. So it would be nice to, to exchange uh, um, opinions about this. And mm. also, we have two projects um, about Korean culture mm. in, in our program. Because I'm working on the influence of Korean culture, the Hallyu, on, mm -hmm. on, on online fiction mm -hmm. in a couple of different languages. Mm -hmm. And there is another pro project about um, music platforms like Spotify, mm -hmm. and also focusing on, on Korea as one of the, of the countries. So I think that there's an opportunity for collaborations uh, and all for Korean yeah. students to maybe have a visiting experience uh, at our university. Right. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, yeah, it's, it's going to be a great opportunity for us to 
I mean, if we're able to uh, collaborate with the uh, Korean studies and um, Korean literature, Korean culture uh, in uh, different countries, um, that will be a wonderful opportunity, so not only for uh, Korean uh, studies experts in, in Korea, but also uh, in, in the world. So I hope I can, we, we can see the more collaborations, uh, not, just, not just in the education, but also in the research as well. Is it that, that's your comments, right? Do, yeah, do you have any I, questions? If I may, I have one, one question, okay, which okay. is about um, what kind of, of response did you see from the students approaching this kind of um, computational or digital methods? Well, maybe I have to answer the question because I'm the only one who actually implemented this idea uh, of, the, of digital humanities course in, uh, to the actual English department students. Uh, I, I, again, I have to remind you that my students uh, is actually in a, a very average level, uh, uh, typical undergraduate students uh, who are very reluctant to learn anything about digital. Okay, so uh, when they, uh, we have, I had about 20 students and, and proceeded with, it, with this uh, course. Uh, I thought, I, I was afraid uh, uh, they, they, will, they might hate uh, this course and for the rest of their life. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, uh, especially when we uh, applied, uh, when you take advantage of ChatGPT technology, when we uh, make a co code uh, to, uh, that is necessary to make a data set for network analysis, uh, they, they, were, they were quite excited. So they thought it was uh, almost impossible for them to understand and uh, make a co uh, code. But with the help of ChatGPT, it's, uh, it ha it's much, much easier for them to not totally understand, but actually they can work in uh, code and then apply that to, to making a data set. So they were very excited. At the same time, at the end of the semester, we had uh, six different uh, student projects. And what I found at the end of the semester is that uh, they were very much excited about the result of what they have done. So they felt like, oh my god, look what I have done. I, I can do this, right? Uh, I, I was, uh, uh, they were kind of digital illiterate but just one semester, at the end of the semester, they had this huge project and displayed and archived and exhibited on the online website. So I, I, I also told my students, uh, I'm going to present this, uh, your, your projects uh, to, to the uh, international audience, the scholars uh, in Graz, Austria, they, they were uh, very excited. So I had, at the end of the semester, about a couple of weeks later, I had a student evaluation. Uh, I was very much surprised, uh, they, they loved it. So. Maybe uh, uh, much more than we expected. Uh, maybe we have, if we apply a right method, uh, right pedagogy, then uh, the re the result might be different. So that's what I uh, that's my one of the takeaways uh, from this experience of the one semester. So I I have a high hope uh, I can do this to my students. Is there other questions? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for the uh, wonderful uh, presentations. Perhaps to follow up on what uh, Professor Kim uh, just said about your students, especially about the uh, disciplinary identity and how open the students are. Uh -huh. um, each presentation um, that we heard just now is geared towards a group of students with a specific major, right? Engineering, right, English, right. Right, uh, linguistics, right. history. So could I ask each of the um, um, panelists to share how you tailor your pedagogy in terms of the features of the students in, in those respective majors? Um, of course, some of you alluded to that uh, already, mm -hmm. uh, but could we hear more about how, uh, what disciplinary uh, considerations do you have in your mm -hmm. teaching? and? Of course, in line with the panel theme, um, what would you keep or what would you draw if you are to teach students beyond mm. these majors? Thank you. Wow, thank you very much for a wonderful question. <laughs> this is a really hard one. <laughs> because 
Uh, I mean, we, we are uh, having uh, four different u universities working uh, on um, four different subjects and along with the uh, engineering fields. When we started this, we didn't have a, a clear view of what we're doing. So what I call is just a loose collaboration. Uh, so what we're going to do in, in each field, and then when we open the course, we're going to see what's going to happen. Uh, that's uh, sort of our loose plan for uh, the future. And so in that sense, we didn't really have the, oh, for this for uh, curriculum system, we need to have this, we need to have that, we need, no, no. So we just wanted to include naturally our expertise together to fill in the gap between the uh, different subjects. So for instance, for my uh, university, it's a, this course is for the engineering students, and then they're really working on the making models. But how, how do we interpret the, uh, the AI-generated sentences and expressions? They didn't really care about it, but <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's offered in the uh, humanities uh, department. So uh, I'm, I'm putting that kind of uh, interpretive traditions into to to the uh, AI generated sentences. They fill in that the gap uh, of what what they're missing. Um, that's my um, situation there. But I mean, if. Uh, Yongsu is offering the course, and then Suyeon is offering the course. If they are taking uh, those courses outside of our university, I'm really excited uh, because, I mean, as for the Suyeon's uh, like presentations, they're using numbers in in order to interpret the historical uh, events uh, from comparative and as well as the world perspective. So. They're, my students are really uh, interested in numbers, but how those numbers are related to the humanistic interpretation, they didn't really care about. But if they're taking that course, they probably yeah, understand better, uh, wow, the world system working like this. That was through the numbers. So, yeah, sure. I quickly add uh, my comment, uh, my response to your question. I think it's a great question. And this, uh, the f different majors, actually, I think, is a great opportunity uh, for, for collaboration. Because uh, in this previous semester, uh, I taught only English major students. This lack of diversity was actually also a huge problem. Their ideas and their imagination were very much uh, similar to each other. So it's very difficult to come up with a very, uh, um, what, what can I say, new ideas, strange ideas. But uh, what I'm uh, hoping for in the third year of this project, if we have these different major students, like uh, German language and Korean studies students and engineering students and English major students, or uh, what, uh, uh, so what kind of things can happen? So one of the big opportunities is that we have a group project that, that, I think that's the key to this uh, teaching method because it's not, it's not just an individual uh, project. We have a group project, collaboration. So actually, I think this is a, it's a very, if uh, professor, uh, teachers has to create this, this chemistry, that, that's the key. But if we succeed in, in creating chemistry uh, between students, I think we can have a much uh, better uh, result and project. Maybe something we didn't expect uh, from this collaboration. What, what can you produce uh, from this collaboration between in engineering students and typical humanities students? So I have a very uh, good expectation. Uh, I, I cannot wait that for that opportunity. Thank you for the question. Add, adding to this, I mean, like, uh, engineering students, I, I mean, so like, Yongsu's uh, class, they don't really have the like deeper coding about how to generate the sentences. But in, in my class, we, we have a like engineering student who could do, do that. So if we, if I open this course to Yongsu's uh, like universities and then uh, Suhyun and uh, Surin's universities, students with, without experience of the coding, can they can jump into the collaboration with the engineering students to generate the, you know, um, 
uh, expressions and sentences and, and then hopefully some sort of uh, narratives and uh, stories. Then we would like to really look, looking forward to see what's going to happen in these, those groups of students who are working with together beyond the boundaries of individual universities. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So, yeah. If there is no, oh, 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 so we're okay. Okay, I have a quick question. Okay. Um, you leave our Okayama University, Japan, and thanks for your reports. Uh, Korean, stu uh, Korean digital humanities education. Okay. Uh, I think we can share as a program how to teach digital humanities <laughs> students. And uh, my question is about how about the Korean government's policy about uh, digital education or data sciences because in Japanese governments uh, strongly drive the data science education mm -hmm. and uh, we have a programming class from the elementary school level mm -hmm. and every single uh, graduate school students mm -hmm. have to learn the data science right. uh, yeah. so I'm interested in how about the uh, Korean governments. <laughs> Actually, uh, Korean government is crazy. crazy. Uh, they, they're driving all the uh, uh, education system into just one uh, software uh, field. So that's a, that's a, I think that's a huge problem. Uh, we, we are, uh, the, the diversity of education is diminishing increasingly, uh, but uh, but one of, one one of the good news uh, uh, in terms of government policies is that they are focusing on uh, digital uh, technology and and this combination of digital technology and humanities. That's that's a very good uh, prospect. Uh, also, another good news is that uh, Korean government is trying very hard to innovate uh, university system. So they want to connect. Uh, different universities. Uh, they, uh, they want to uh, innovate this, our current education, uh, higher education system into a networked system. So our project is kind of co-aligns uh, with that direction and, and the government policies. So I think there's a very good opportunity, in, especially in terms of digital humanities. As I said in the beginning of the, of the presentation, uh, we, we are lacking uh, 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 educate teachers uh, who can cover this, this huge demand for digital humanities education. So network education uh, is, a, again, is a good solution to this problem. So uh, by taking advantage of these government policies, we, we may uh, create a new kind of platform or model uh, maybe not just for Korea, uh, as you said, we, we can uh, we, we have a networked education system with Japan or Hong Kong, in the, the, at least in the same time zone. So maybe you can develop this into an international, global uh, education model. So I, I, have, I think uh, that that's a great uh, prospect for our project. Thank you very much. Uh, our time is over, so I really appreciate your attention and, and, and participation. Thank you.